Yes, I yes, and you know, Tiffany actually emailed me and said, in the spirit of um, of asynchronous learning, I'm not going to be there today, Lee. But remember to press the record button. <laughs> okay, Tiffany, I'll try. So I did. I pressed the record button. Um, next week we're going to be setting up. Um, first of all, you'll choose two of your colleagues to do a quality matters review of their website, and that's actually of their website, and then you'll um, you'll meet with them synchronously to talk about your review of their website, which is the way that the Quality Matters um, process actually occurs. So uh, if you have any questions, it's pretty self-explanatory, but if you have any questions about the Quality Matters rubric, please email me and I will get that sign-up page up for you and your assignment up by Sunday so that you'll be able to get started. And, um, and so, that being said, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Heidi Olson. And Heidi is an instructional designer with whom many of us are familiar. And I'm, I'm not seeing her right now, so I'm just kind of meeting people, just hoping to see Heidi's um, video. Perhaps when she starts speaking, we'll see her. So, um, so Heidi, thank you for joining us, and I will turn it over to you. Hey, well, thank you. Well, and thank you, uh, Lee, for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity, and um, I've been uh, listening to some of the other presentations, and it's all really great information. Um, so it's nice to, nice to be a part of all of this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my. I put in the chat. Um, how's my sound coming over? Am I coming over all right? It's a little bit quiet. Okay. I will try to speak up and I will try to use my mic here. Let's see if that's any better. I'm going to try to speak up louder. I am a golf speaker, but I will try. <laughs> so, is uh, let's look at the chat here. Is that any better now that I'm um, that I made some adjustments? It's it's not actually. Um, Brandy is saying she's she's not able to hear well. I'm sorry, Heidi. Okay, I'm going to get. Real close here and see if I can't uh, make this any better. I apologize. Um, I thought let me the audio setting here. That was a lot better, but now we've it seems we've lost your voice altogether. Maybe. Okay. No, no, we've got you. We've got you. Okay. Um. Well, I will try to check periodic periodically to make sure that we're still staying connected here. Um. So I am going to share out my presentation. I did uh, put, I'm using SlideRocket for the presentation, and I did put an embed link on um, on the blog site that I put in the chat, so you can go look at that later. And I found that um, I'm, I'm going to be showing a lot of links, so I also just made a list of all the links um, because I know how frustrating it is sometimes to watch a presentation and. All you'd want is the link, the resource to go back to. So I hope you will find that helpful. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, facilitating asynchronous courses. So just uh, a little general information here. Um, there's a picture of Heidi and um, my adopted dog, Maddie. I like to, I don't have my own personal dog, so I like to use other people's dogs to accompany me on my walks and hikes and um, hang out and um, I, I get the fun part, and then when they're all smelly, um, I can give them back to their owners and not have to deal with that. Uh, I do work at University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I work in the UAS e-learning program. I do live in Juneau, um, which I'm very grateful for, because I love it there. So, uh, but I am able to continue my work because I do work in online education and distance education. So I am a remote worker, so often I will have a different perspective on things like communicating and um, facilitating or participating in meetings because I, I do, uh, I am often the, the only remote person. 
So um, I do have some pretty strong opinions about what you really, how you really should perform and, and include everyone within uh, a meeting. So I have my email address here. I have a Twitter uh, account, and then there's a link to my blog. Um, I also, uh, I've been working in um, distance education for over 20 years now. Um, I started out with the, the correspondence type model, um, and as technology and the things have evolved, you know, of course, moving more into the online realm. Most of the um, facilitation and, and work I do with faculty are is in asynchronous online courses. Um, and they're usually, you know, non-location based um, and, and variations of um, being asynchronous. I also teach uh, asynchronous desktop publishing course in uh, Adobe InDesign, so I have sort of a graphic layout design background. And um, at UAS eLearning, I have just a couple links here. Um, we are an e-learning and distance ed program that offers um, online courses. We have about 200 courses, and they're available to anyone um, who can find them. Uh, we're moving more more away from sort of open year-long courses with open enrollment and mostly concentrating on semester-type courses because we've really found that having a cohort of students is, is really better for most students in success in completing the course. Um, I have the fantastic opportunity of working with an incredible instructional design team. There's 13 of us, and they are they are very talented. We're all very talented. Well, they are. They all are very talented, and I gain my inspiration, and I just try to keep up with with all of their talent. But um, it's 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 just amazing what um, what comes out of this group, and we all feed off, off each other. So I'm very grateful to have that opportunity. We do have a, uh, a resource for asynchronous learning. Um, it's called I Teach You, and it's a, a collection of instructional material for developing specifically online, uh, online courses. And um, we have it divided up into different sections to try to, to try to separate some of the mechanics of designing and facilitating a course. So I'm just going to offer that um, as a resource for you. Um, so there are it's just the introductory material. But what I wanted to ask is what I wanted to make sure we're all kind of um, on the same uh, same boat as to what an asynchronous course is. So maybe if you could just type in the chat, let me know what you think an asynchronous course means. Um, and also, if you can, if you have, if you've heard any myths or misunderstandings about asynchronous learning, uh, anything that you um, have maybe witnessed firsthand or have have heard from other people um, that they've been concerned about, if you could maybe put those in chat too, that would um, be good. Okay, so anything non-face-to-face, -face, not real time, you can take it at your own pace. Good. Good. Okay. So we're looking at check students checking in, and there maybe aren't any deadlines. Okay. And any any misunderstandings or maybe. Uh, concerns that that you've heard people have with um, that uh, that when you say I'm taking or I'm teaching an asynchronous course, um, anything that comes to mind. So sometimes asynchronous courses um, are related to sort of uh, reading a book and taking a test. And not an interaction, but there's you know certainly various levels of, of different types of asynchronous courses. Okay. Well, hopefully, um, as you go through, as I go through this, we'll come up, we'll get a better understanding of maybe some of those myths and understandings. Um, we're going to kind of focus on three different areas for asynchronous courses. 
um, designing and preparing materials, uh, facilitating, and um, and sort of the review, revise, reflect process, which you know, all, all these elements actually go into all sorts of course design, um, but we're going to talk specifically about um, how, you, how these ranks relate to asynchronous courses. And how is my sound? Am I coming over all right? Okay, I'll try to lean in. Um, so as I was thinking about uh, course design, um, I, it, I just immediately thought of um, a family reunion. So this is my family all uh, at a reunion. Um, we're actually at the Methodist camp in, um, outside of Juneau. Um, and when you're, when you're thinking of when you're planning a reunion, you have to plan. You have to pick a site, uh, make sure it's available to everybody. Uh, you have to pack your clothes. And some of us um, may pack for different kinds of weather. I mean, you say, oh, let's come to Juneau. You immediately want to pack your raincoat. Um, in this case, it was like 85 degrees, so, you know, we wanted to make sure people have the appropriate clothing. So you have to have your packing done. Um, you have to do some planning, um, how long, how many days, maybe some food. You have to plan some travel. People have different travel. Uh, you know, some people came by plane. Some people came by ferry. Some people drove in the car. Uh, you have different things. So as you're, you're planning your course, you're sort of packing and planning up front uh, a lot of elements that will um, will make for a successful reunion. So we have the reunion, we have the date set, and now we sort of need to facilitate that. So another element of asynchronous courses or course design is facilitating that, making sure everything runs smoothly. Um, we have people to pick up at the airport, we have to send a reminder, um, you know, Bring bugs so, uh, We have a barbecue that we're coordinating with other people that aren't necessarily in the family, but a larger family that are coming for one day. We have to make sure uh, things get picked up at the store for food. We have to have an inventory of the food and drinks to make sure we don't run out. Uh, then we have the group photo that always takes place. Um, my family, we we have the same position every year, um, and we do that chronologic chronologically. Right, make sure, oh, yeah, talk about about food. In my family, we have gluten-free, we have uh, um, vegetarians, we have carbohydrate-free, we have the meat eaters. So, um, exactly, you have a lot of these details that you have to facilitate. And then you have the reunion, and now it's time to kind of reflect and review. Um, in this case, you know, you're collecting all of your collecting photos that you're taking. Um, some people are going to blog about it to share things that they've done, talk about the really fantastic times, talk about the funny stories. Uh, you know, you're, you're sharing, you're sharing this information, you're, you're sharing it with other people, and you're also kind of keeping notes for next time. Um, so next time we get together, you know, this person didn't like this, or we have to remember to do this. So you're kind of keeping track of what we're what was successful at work, what wasn't so much fun, um, so that next year, you know, you can have a better time, maybe. So those are kind of the three areas, I mean, I've related that to a family reunion. Um, as I was thinking about um, asynchronous courses, um, there was this video that came out this last spring, and um, it kind of went viral. It was about a high school student, Jeff Bliss, um, who has had sort of an outburst in his class. And um, what it, maybe the way he delivered the message, maybe that could have been done a little bit differently. But I think his message is, is really strong. And um, I try to remember this as I'm working with um, instructors. And, um, you know, it's, it's the student is the customer. And you have to make sure that we're satisfying the customer. So I'm going to play this video here. Get up your teacher and say, hey, they don't work in the package, you know? The children who don't work like that, they need to learn to face the face. You just get mad because I'm pointing out the obvious. No, no, wasting time. 
telling you what you need to do. Yeah. You want kids to come into your class? You want them to get excited yeah. for this? You got to come in here. You got to make them excited. You want a kid to change and start doing better? You got to touch his freaking heart. You can't expect a kid to change. If all you do is just tell him. You got you to gotta take this job serious. This is the future of this nation. And when you come in here, like you did. So I don't know how well you were able to hear that, but I did include the link um, on, on that blog site, and I'll get it to you again. But basically, I mean, he's had it with reading packets. Apparently, his teacher's giving him reading packets, and he is tired of reading and answering what, some sort of assessment. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, he, he wants to talk, he wants to discuss, he wants that activity. And, um, you know, he, he, he says, you know, this is my future. I, I, and in order for me to be excited about this, you have to touch my heart. You have to give me something that I can chew on and I can relate to. I can't relate to the reading packet. So, um, so I just, you know, if you can get a chance to watch that on your own and, it's not very long, um, but I, I, I just really, it touched my heart, and it reminded me why why I'm doing what I like to do, and um, I, I just need to always keep that in perspective. And um, even with asynchronous courses, you, you need to get beyond the reading packet mentality and add some activity, um, give the, the students some, a chance to be creative and to express him or herself, because um, that's that's a really powerful way to um, assess understanding and things like that. So just a kind of a thought question. Um, what kind of a class are you planning? Are you kind of planning a more independent class? Or are you uh, planning a more active and a participatory class that it perhaps has a cohort who's working through the class at the same time where you might have um, where you might you might not have um, meeting times but you do have sort of benchmarks throughout the class that you want a class to meet to kind of keep them together. So you doubt do have some date synchronicity, I guess you could call it. Um, that's you know that's that's one of the strategies that most of our courses are taking um, that we're finding more success in. There is also a definite place for independent type classes to sort of learn as you go at will learning, and um, you know, and some of those type courses, then you don't need to worry so much about building the community. Um, you just, but you do also want to make sure that you're delivering a good product and you have enough different types of assessments. Um, so that it's uh, your students are motivated to keep going. So let's talk about the design elements. So sometimes, um, as you know, your plans don't always come out like you think, like two urinals like next to each other. That is kind of a bad design plan. Um, so, and especially in asynchronous course. You're going to pre-build most of your course before you offer it. You have a lot of uh, your upfront development time is very heavy. Um, you're going to want to have pretty much the entire course built at least before con content and the structure built. And then as you work along through the course, you're going to want to add current events. And also, as you get to know your students, you're going to want to add, um, you know, something that's specific to what their interests are or or their area of, of interest or, or professional life if, if it's a professional class. Um, so the design elements, um, you know, are, are pretty extensive. Um, and this is kind of the design process that we go through. Um, you know, we, we start, we get all the schedule, we know what the class is, and we we look at um, instructional design elements, understand value design, what are your outcomes, sort of map out some assessments. Um, and then we look at building the course, act you know, actually building, how are we going to, um, how, what are the assignments going to look like, what is the, 
see that going to look like? What are the reflections? Um, how are we going to build social presence in a community? Some of the health and technical requirements that belong in a class. We're building presentation and content material. Um, and then we, you know, we get a sign off. We go through a checklist, much like quality matters checklist. Um, so you have this process. And then often this arrow, you know, you're ready to enroll, but then it comes back here again after the class is over and you kind of uh, do an assessment to, to see how all these elements came out. So you um, have to decide. Yes. I'm sorry. You may, if you're going to talk about this in a few minutes, I just thought they may not be um, aware of uh, sort of the instructional design model that you all use because um, you actually have an instructional design team that helps faculty with this. Uh, you might be talking about that later, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, we use understanding by design model where um, it's sort of backwards, um, backwards design where you look at the outcome that you want first before you start developing content. So you kind of know where you're going, and then as you know what the final objective is, you you build you kind of work backwards to make sure that all of the elements in your class, your activities, your assessments, um, and then finally your content all all are in line so that they so the the whole picture uh, goes along with a roadmap to your final outcome. So that's kind of the process that um, that we use. And then the do the individual instructors build their courses or do you all, with the technical aspects of the courses, do the individual instructors do that? Do you all facilitate that for them or is it a combination? Yeah, it's kind of a combination. Um, you know, we when we meet with instructors, um, you know, some are very tech savvy and, and want to do things and are willing to do things on their own. And um, so we just help facilitate the kind of breakout path. Um, and then we do have some instructors who, you know, if you can help me build it and help me understand it the first time, then I'll get a better understanding for the next time we do a class. And some components, um, if they want some custom activities that take some uh, flash experience or other type of um, you know programming, then you know we can we can split that out and do that. Um, but we're you know we're we're wanting the instructor to take ownership of the course, much like we would want students to take ownership of a course in their learning. So we're trying to provide all the materials and and um, concept and help them work out through the concept, um, and then also teach them the skills if they're interested in um, actually building courses on their own. So it's kind of a combination. And we we use um, Blackboard as a learning management system. Um, so a lot of instructors are already kind of familiar with that format or that system. Um, we also use WordPress as a um, blogging open website platform. So we, as a, as a unit, we actually encourage open courses. Um, that are not behind the blackboard wall as far as content and some uh, discussion um, and using blackboard as a, a place for assessments and um, grade feedback so kind of using a combination but probably most of most of our instructors are just using blackboard as a content system. So when we're working on a course, we actually have a checklist that we use that was specifically built for asynchronous courses. Um, so when we are first thinking about a class, um, we have this checklist that we will again revisit at after the course is developed. Um, this is not this checklist does not include actually teaching the class. It just is the design of the course, um, although it does have hopefully some of those. Um, triggers for facilitating the course or should be built into the course already. So, uh, it's kind of divided um, by a welcome area um, in an asynchronous course. Sometimes you're welcome and you're getting started area is the most important of your course. Um, 
yes, everything here uh, is is available for copies. Um, and uh, Creative Commons copies and um, yeah, everything you would be happy to share. Uh, so some, so your welcome is often the most important and um, well, most important part of the course because you have to get the student into the course, you have to get them started, get them ready, and we're going to talk about a little bit about that later. Um, so our checklist is still by, uh, separated by the welcome, and we have a syllabus section, and most of these. Um, check marks, checkpoints are from uh, faculty senate requirements, so a lot of those may or may not apply to, to the class that you're teaching. Um, but a syllabus in, a, in an asynchronous course is um, almost always way more extensive than you would have in a face-to-face -face class. Um, then we have a course content area where we have some uh, some criteria for um, for items that should be included in course content, uh, interaction and collaboration. Uh, we have an assessment piece and a learner support piece. So, um, yes, yeah, this is um, this is similar to a quality matters. So I had talked about the getting started, and here is um, some information about uh, some suggestions for things you can include in a getting started uh, folder, or if you're using WordPress, uh, a getting started page, or some area of your course where you outline how to get started. Um, you want some sort of a welcome letter for the student, uh, and in this and in this example. Um, there are six different steps to really get started in the course. Um, we, so we have a little checklist here, uh, the six elements, and then each of the steps is further framed out um, with more specifics, like reading the syllabus and where you find it. Um, there's an introductory assignment as an example in this course. So there's a due date and um, gives you information about finding the forum and what questions you want to link, what, what you want to answer. Information about forwarding email. Um, most institutions will want the student to use their institutional email, uh, which may or may not be the student's preference. So uh, you have to kind of make a choice on whether or not you're going to be flexible or if you will only use the institutional email, and then it's the student's responsibility to make sure that they're forwarding that. So including that kind of information. Uh, Making sure your technology is, is up to snuff, uh, up to date browsers. Um, some learning management, management systems work better with certain browsers, so giving the students that heads up. Uh, if you're using any sort of um, unusual content in your class, make sure you have players and, and technical support information for your students so that they can test it out before the class. Gets underway and make sure that they're ready for the actual learning and participating. Uh, so a getting started uh, folder, um, you know, any anything that doesn't really possibly relate to the to the actual need of your course, but is supplementary, and you want students to try things out and and get in there, um, should be included in some sort of getting started folder. When you're building your course, you want to also make sure that your navigation makes sense. Um, it should be simple and straightforward. Uh, you know, you don't want students to be to having to click too many times to get to where they need to go um, because it, it just gets annoying to click. And it also uh, is, is then prone to getting back to where you started or just finding out where you were or finding things. So having a good clean navigation is important and um, either in a learning management system or if it's something to build. Uh, this is what we use. This is an example of what we might use in one of our courses in Blackboard. Uh, so we have an announcement getting started, syllabus, a class schedule, assignment, uh, discussion, 
Um, the middle section is sort of the classroom management IT booth, how to contact the instructors, my grade. Grade book is always um, important for students. And um, and then the bottom area would be some, um, some student support. So libraries, OIT, um, if your course is within a program, you might have a link to your department for program. Um, so yeah, so having a good clean navigation that doesn't uh, require too many clicks um, is kind of an important design element. We also have, um, we suggest the consistency in how your lesson module, I'm going to use module, lesson, week, unit, however you have it framed, um, what you want the student to do each time, each week probably, um, to have a similar format. So we have um, a format where, uh, so, this, so this module structure might be the same as like week one or the specific dates for the week. Uh, we have an introduction, um, something to hook the students in. Oftentimes, it's something multimedia related that, that the instructors created, introducing, introducing the students to the concepts of the course, tying them to what was learned perhaps last week or what's to come. Uh, we have some object objectives, and often they're written in one, two, three form. However, um, I fully support more um, narrative type objectives. Uh, sometimes that's easier for students to understand. Um, and I think it also helps you as an instructor to make sure your writing objectives that are, are measurable if you can uh, write it in a sentence or a, a, a paragraph rather than one, two, three. Um, you know, it, it, that's a choice. Uh, then you are going to have some sort of reading or viewing assignment, uh, a lecture note or narrative or other content, presentation content that the instructor might create on their own or um, or get, get from some other resource. Um, then you're going to have some sort of activity or solve a problem, um, some sort of maybe just thought questions uh, where you're giving students a, a chance to kind of practice and do things on their own um, before they're actually performing for you. Um, maybe some sort of assessment or a quiz with auto grade, that's auto graded so you're getting immediate feedback. One of the main uh, drawbacks of asynchronous learning is the latency between answering something or asking a question and getting an answer. So oftentimes uh, self-graded quiz or test can, um, can help us use some of that confusion and, um, and it gives a, a, a student some sort of immediate information on, on, on their, their understanding. Uh, certainly additional resources uh, could go in there, should go in there, um, and then some sort of assignment, um, a discussion forum, or blog post, or some sort of uh, interaction with the, with the cohort of students. And then you might have some sort of journal or a reflection assignment. Um, so you're not going to have all of these every time. Um, and you probably don't because your student would um, be spending too much time with your class and not having any fun. Uh, so you're going to kind of pick and choose, but you do want to make sure you're hitting, you know, some of the basic elements um, and uh, and keep them in some sort of a logical order so it's not so disruptive on the student side. Heidi, uh, do you all um, target a number of hours, or do you recommend? Uh, planning for a certain number of hours that a student should spend in a course, average, I mean, some will spend yeah. more, some less, but do you sort of look for a range there? Well, um, we're actually going to talk about that a little bit later, but, um, you know, it's very hard in, a, in an online asynchronous course to count hours because you can kind of guesstimate on how much reading might take or how much research might take. Um, but it's very hard to really, um, you know, say, well, you know, if you're in a class, that's an hour. Um, but you can't, it's very hard to make that connection. So what we often do um, is talk about effort of participation. 
So we'll break uh, a class down um, into uh, different um, uh, I want to say um, different areas of learning and devote sort of a percentage of time spent in the class on that on that on that area. So let me see if I can actually find that since we're talking. Um, actually, it's in the syllabus area. Student effort. Uh, we break it down into um, instruction, individual research, assignments, and collaboration. So we have all our, all our courses broken down into those three areas and ask instructors to kind of assign a percentage of effort. Uh, so that's, so it's very, like I say, it's hard to count seat time. So we kind of look at these categories um, as a way of, um, as, a, as a way of replacing. I, I, certainly, I, w I would say that in general, most of our students are going to say that an asynchronous course is more time intensive often than their face to face classes. So, the way it goes. We like to keep to those higher standards. <laughs> okay, well, there was that. All right, we got the navigation. Uh, So one thing that um, is really important in an asynchronous course is that you have to be very clear in your direction and writing your instructions. Uh, it, it often helps to have someone else look at your instructions to make sure they're very clear. Because oftentimes when you do something or you're familiar with how it's done, uh, you forget little steps. And nothing's more frustrating for an asynchronous student to not be able to understand um, what needs to be done. So writing very clear directions is really important. Um, using images, annotated images, to, to show where to click on things. Or um, even we, we have a lot of instructors who do a video tour of their course as an introduction to the class. Uh, so it's like just laying it all out, very similar to what you would do in a face-to-face -face course when you're going over a syllabus. Um, you know, we, we try to, to be very clear um, visually um, in the same way in an asynchronous class. So another area that's uh, important in the class is the syllabus. And um, So as I mentioned, uh, the syllabus is usually going to be much longer than you would have in a face-to-face -face class, because um, you really have to anticipate the questions and try to put in as much information about how the class is run as you can, because you're students and you aren't going to have the benefit of that um, asking questions uh, and getting an immediate response. So um, have some information about Things to include, um, certainly any sort of requirements by your institution or standards um, or uh, for school and education or professional agencies um, or organizations, you're going to have standards or um, competencies that you're going to want to include in the class. Um, you know, how to get started, how to submit assignments. One thing about asynchronous classes, you have to anticipate how students are going to get things to you. So oftentimes through the LMS, um, you're going to have built-in ways, um, but you want to make sure that um, that you have uh, Plan B on some of those uh, on those ways, so that you're not disrupting um, the flow of the class. Uh, instructor response time and how to check your grades. How how long is it going to take? How long do you anticipate um, you um, returning lessons um, or giving feedback? Uh, so there's a lot of elements within um, a syllabus that you may not, uh, including the face-to-face -face class, that is certainly necessary when you're meeting things synchronously. Um, 
And one of the important pieces is kind of consolidating that into some sort of a calendar or planning schedule. Uh, we have um, right, we have um, some different um, templates to help do that. This one is a Word template, and it's a whole semester's week with a, on one page. Some people uh, find that very handy just to kind of jot some things in. Here's uh, an example that's filled out with some reading assignments, what sort of assessment is due, the points, the grand, the, the due date. Um, so that's one template. Heidi, I used um, Google Calendar this year for that. And I want to tell you, it saved me, I know you know this, but it saved me so much time. Ah. Because, yeah, I used to I used to do this, but then just for the first time, for whatever reason, I got really excited about Google Calendar and did that for all of my um, asynchronous classes. And it was just so easy. And oh, students seem to really enjoyed it. I mean, I think it's easy to follow, so just just sharing that. Yeah, that's great. That's um, I, that that would uh, I like that idea. I, I wish there was a way, easy way to um, export that for another semester. <laughs> that information that would <laughs> that would be helpful. Um, I myself like to do things in Excel because I like to merge uh, rows. Um, oh yeah, my Cal export. Thanks, Colin. That's a, that might work. Um, so here's just an example of a, a schedule done in Excel. Um, and then another example, um, a more word related, um, broken down by unit and more specific with different areas within the class, um, points and due dates. So um, this checklist is actually something that um, when we're developing a class, um, kind of the two elements that we um, produced fairly soon after the class has been talked about is a syllabus, complete syllabus, and this course checklist. Um, because after these two elements are done, it's very easy then to just start building the course. So, um, of course, you know, there's things you have to change as the course goes along, but, 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 but a course checklist like this is something that we use to help um, build the course. So let me go back to. I know you're probably going to get to this because you did mention that you had, um, and you had some. Yeah, this is exactly what I was about to ask. Okay. <laughs> because I know, because yes, I've worked at a distance before too, and so the this can be really important because it has to be so uh, intentional. So now I'm going to be quiet and listen <laughs> to you talk about it. That's great, right. yeah, thank you. So um, expectations, you really need to be clear, just like you're writing clear instructions or directions, you really need to be clear about what your expectations are. You're getting students, you know, different, perhaps different students from all different areas, so um, there, you have to be very explicit and very upfront about what, um, what you want from them and how you want things formed. So I, I talked a little bit about participant um, level. Uh, open this again. Um, so I, I talked about the participation and effort um, compared to seat time, but you also need to kind of model what you anticipate, how you anticipate students participating. Um, if you're not having any synchronous sessions, then how how are they collaborating? How are they getting their work done? How are they communicating with you? Um, and outside of class, class I use in quotes, um, you know, are they are they participating at a level where they're reflecting on the learning? Are they able to relate it to other things? How many times throughout the week? Um, are they talking about the topic? How are, are they, you know, when they're in the shower, walking on the beach, are they thinking about the topic and, and, and trying to 
perhaps even teach it to someone else or get in a discussion with someone else? What what is their what is your expectation for their participation in the class? Um, are they using the the um, the language? Um, so participation level, you know, at a at not just at this moment of the class, but on a wider scale. What what are you expecting the students to, to be doing? Um, expectations in um, in uh, in forming blog posts. You know, oftentimes a rubric will help you or give a student a better idea of what you're looking for as far as a good answer or a complete answer. Um, so using rubrics is one way um, of 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 sharing that expectation. Um, providing sample answers um, for questions. Uh, here's, um, here's some sample answers for uh, questions about identification terms. You know, is there any word length? No, but keep it short and sweet. You know, we're looking for the, the gist of the, the term. Uh, so providing some sample answers, providing um, sample papers research papers or uh, or examples of things that you think have been done well. Um, this is also very helpful for students um, for uh, for you know getting better quality work from your students and saying this is what I'm expecting. Please, you know, raise to this occasion and this is what I think is good and, and sometimes instructors um, have to create bad examples. So you know, this this would not you know I would not allow any points for this. But this is a much better answer. So providing those those examples and models for expectations is very helpful. There's also um, your expectations on availability. So as I mentioned before, what is your response time on returning lessons? What is your response time on answering questions or returning phone calls? Uh, one thing about asynchronous courses is that um, students often think that you're available 24-7. Um, maybe you are, maybe, but probably you aren't. So setting up those expectations about when you're going to make yourself available and what, what's working for you. Um, to, you know, if you're going to be out of town, make sure you're telling your students that I'm not going to be available during this time. Also make sure the students understand your preferred communication. As I mentioned before, do you want them to use your institutional email address? Uh, how, how do you want to communicate with the students? Getting those parameters up front. Um, also pushing information out. Um, if, if you are a Twitter user, like we is, she's created tags for Twitter posts. So it's easy to find those. Um, use Vivo as a social bookmarking tool. Create a category or a or a tag or a group um, so that so that students know where to find your information. So putting that information out um, up front is um, is very important. So just a just a thought here um, as you're building your classes. How how do you push information out? How do you share information with uh, your class, with your colleagues, with your peers, with your family. Um, just, just think about how you, you connect, collect, reflect, and share. What, what is your personal learning environment or your personal learning network look like? Um, that's where some of this all comes in. And as an asynchronous teacher, um, you know, this, this is important um, that you do have some kind of presence. Heidi, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're getting some sort of crackle. Okay. Do you understand? I'm sorry. I might be playing with my headset. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will not do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are, are there any questions here? Barbara, you're sort of using a, um, a blended approach, aren't you, to your class? Um, yes, I am using a blended, although I'm trying to wrap my mind around uh, really getting it set up for 
an asynchronous, you know, in the event I have kids who are not there and they need to come in and grab information or if I have students who need to go back and grab information because they weren't, you know, not clear because it wasn't presented clear, but just because they need a repeat of the information. Yeah. So all of this yeah. that is being presented, I'm just putting it to the my sixth grade unit test and it's like, yep, yep, doing all this. <laughs> the only thing I'm I'm thinking is, you know, as I'm developing this unit for uh, kind of challenged students, I'm wanting to make sure that I always have set the bar so I collect all of my students. I'm thinking some of this for younger students would be really overwhelming. Like I think presenting all the information ahead, you know, a syllabus and all that kind of thing, it'd be good for me to have so that I'm organized, but I think it would probably, frankly, scare a lot of the students if they had too much. So, um, you know, but I think it's just, it's all good for um, setting it up and designing the unit and then presenting it, you know, appropriately for the audience that you have. Right, and, and you know, definitely my emphasis is on um, higher ed, so. Um, right. Yeah, and we, and we do have, um, there are, some classes where the, the weekly content is um, is pushed out separately or individually, so you're not looking at the whole course. You're looking at what to do for the week. So in that case, it's, it's um, not overwhelming, not as overwhelming. But I, I do really, um, one point you made about um, one of the great advantage of ACs and the is the ability to go back and look at things again a second or third time instead of being only presented with them once. So that's um, that's a really good point about having the opportunity to go back at your own pace and and review things. So Heidi, I had a question about cohorts and uh, how what methods do you use to encourage uh, cohorts to bind together? Yeah, to that's class? yeah, that's um, that can sometimes be difficult. Um, Having a really good introduction assignment, I think, helps get that started. Um, it, it also helps if you have someone in the in the class that kind of helps facilitate that for you. Um, I I think when we're gonna we're gonna talk about facilitating and building community in, in a little bit, but um, I think sometimes sometimes you're gonna have people that aren't gonna want to participate and you kind of have to just let them go. You can't worry too much about them. Um, you can do all the encouragement, you know, certainly points help. Um, but I think having um, having a place where they can talk that's more open and off topic sometimes helps uh, or, or not directing the conversation as much so that so that they can see they can have a have a side conversation going. Um, but that is very sometimes very difficult to keep everyone engaged at the same time. Um, that, yeah. If I could, um, if if you don't mind me jumping in too, please, Heidi, please. I, that's one of the first things that um, that I noticed about facilitating um, online discussions because I really wanted to. Uh, to be in the in the conversation because I was so excited about it, but I found that when I participated, the students stopped participating. Um, and so um, it, there's a really fine line between dominating the conversation, <laughs> uh, being visible in the class, which you can be visible in many many ways, and it does not have to be on the discussion board, um, and then creating uh, creating connections with the students. We want students to create strong connections with each other and with us. But I have become, uh, well, except in the format we're using right now, in our open format, this seems to not be as problematic. But in the closed format, but it could also be because we've been a cohort for a while and we've been together. Um, but in the closed classroom, I find that peer-to-peer -peer connections happen in the discussion and have to be monitored, evaluated, encouraged, but I, 
I very rarely participate there just because of the way it cuts off the communication. Um, but then in the, in the feedback, making that personal connection with students through meaningful and personalized feedback can, can be a way. I also love weekly journaling um, for getting to know students. Uh, thank you, Barbara. That's because I don't say anything. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I, I really enjoy weekly journaling because that helps me to feel connected to students. So anyway, I just had to jump in there with that. That's my little passion, um, <laughs> my little bit of passion. Um, now, we do have, we do have about 15 minutes. Heidi, do you think that, oh gosh, that, do you think, yeah. how, how might we do this? Okay, I will, um, because I am this going, has been so great. Yeah, I, I didn't, um, I didn't, I have more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So one thing, one thing else that Lee, thank you, you sparked some some thoughts for me. I think asynchronous instructors usually ha are more personal in their class and trying to establish relationships with their students than face-to-face -face instructors are. You kind of have to put yourself out there in order for your students to feel more comfortable and to put themselves out there. So you really have to model the behavior that you want from your students. And um, I found that when I, I also kind of stay out of the discussion, I just kind of monitor, but I do give individual feedback to the students and I say, hey, you know, thanks for getting this discussion going. And, and then I, for the ones that are hanging, you know, not participating as much, it's like, hey, you know, you talk to me about this and I think the class would really like to hear about that. Could you maybe share that on the discussion board? Um, so t sometimes those little personal, uh, notes or something that can kind of fill the cohort. And I've also, um, there's a, a tool that you can use with Blackboard that actually diagrams what the discussion board posts look like. And it would be nice if there were other, there are probably other tools, analytics to show you, but sometimes um, if you if you take a snapshot of who's posting and who's talking to each other, that can have a really visual effect on the students. So if you have a student who's not communicating very much, you can say, hey, um, yeah, um, yeah, it could be like a tree view. Um, this is actually just a complete diagram for a whole discussion board. Um, and um, sometimes that helps to, well, it helps you to see who's talking to each other and who's perhaps dominating the, the conversation. And, um, and, um, and, and it also just shows how, well, like we said, when she enters a conversation, sometimes that just stops everything. So that also shows all of that. So sometimes diagramming out what the discussion looks like um, is, a, is a, I'm a visual learner, so that would really make a big impact on me. Um, so we have some other things to consider um, in the course. I already mentioned how you're going to collect assignments, how you give feedback. Telling us we had a, a, an administrator from UA come in and very mad because his daughter wasn't getting any feedback in an English class. And we contacted the instructor and the student uh, was not checking track changes in Microsoft Word. And the student was definitely getting feedback, but she just didn't know how to find them, how to find the feedback. So giving that information. Um, technical support, you often have to put in a bunch more technical support elements in your class. Bandwidth, I've provided a calculator so you could uh, determine what download time for a different file size might be. This is really relevant for rural and urban connections that aren't on high bandwidth. Uh, firewalls, consider that. Um, and, you know, different learning styles. And one thing that was mentioned in um, the international asynchronous session that we did was um, careful use of humor. Uh, in an asynchronous class, sometimes you can't always provide that same humor because it's, it's harder to, to come over in a, in a print version or um, without some kind of follow-up. Um, so we have our packing and planning done. Um, 
Some ways to facilitate that cohort is um, to have a first contact assignment within the first couple days of your class. You want to make sure students are getting in, getting connected, um, communicating with you and with their peers um, right up front um, before things get too crazy and the content becomes so heavy. You want to make sure that they have kind of all those kinks worked out. Um, and I've already talked a little bit about uh, availability expectations. Um, you know, you don't, you can't be a stopwatch, uh, or you want to be more like a stopwatch and less like a Google clock that you'll go crazy with um, trying to respond um, as things come in. Um, set to your schedule and stick to it. Um, having those daily and weekly announcements really helps to have, to build that community and to remind people that there is a class, sometimes with asynchronous class, it gets put to the bottom of the list. Um, and you want to make sure that students are staying on task um, in a timely manner. Um, always have a plan B. So um, if you have your stuff in, um, if you have uh, your, all your content in a learning management system, it, you might want to take some screenshots or PDF shots of the different modules um, so that you can refer to them or your student or you can give them to students in case something happens. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. Um, and then, just because you have an asynchronous class doesn't mean you can't have some sort of synchronous session. Um, it's probably going to have a recording like this one does. Uh, you might even consider um, online collaboration if they're having a technical issue. You could use a tool like Join Me or Team Viewer, or we could both log in on an internet connection and I can share my desktop with you, or you could share, or I could see yours and help you work through some tech, tech issues. And then there's always, of course, the phone. Um, don't forget about using that uh, that format. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, so kind of helping to facilitate building that community, providing a space for students to do that off topic, a place for asking questions or sharing. I was just in a class, a research class, and we didn't have a place to share with the other students. And uh, we also didn't have access to email addresses, and um, I felt very alone, and I kept pushing and pushing, and it, it just never happened. So I was learning on my own, and I didn't like that very much. I, I needed that cohort and um, the ability to ask questions and to share. So that was a um, bad experience for me. Um, having some sort of introductory activity in your class to get things going, to set things set things up and oftentimes in that introductory activity we'll try to have to get something from the student that you may use later on. So perhaps if you're in a math class you might have students posting pictures of favorite shapes um, or buildings or something and then later use that image um, to discuss area or finding um, finding a, something mathematical, sorry, that's out of my element. <laughs> uh, finding an area, surface, measuring, um, force, something like that. Uh, you might, in an ethics or history class, you might have students posting um, pictures of people who they aspire to be or um, some, someone that they look up to. And then later in the class, use some of those personalities and um, things as part of your content or the board. Weekly announcement. So using something in the introduction to kind of um, to use throughout the class. Fish. We had an intro of fish class where people were posting favorite pictures of fish, and then when it came down to actually talking about species, she pulled those um, uh, those pictures of fish um, out and used them. Um, to, you know, and even mentioned the student who uh, who suggested them. Um, if you haven't already heard or read uh, Seven Principles of Good Practice for Undergraduate Education, it's really seven nice, concise elements that um, 
that are good to uh, to keep in mind in all kinds of educational practices or training as well. Um, some elements that um, that are important to to think about. Um, talking about discussion, and I'm going to include sort of blog posts as well as discussion forums sort of in the same element because you're all talking about student peer uh, participation and um, and in peer-to-peer -peer communication, the cohort working together. Uh, once again, talk about those expectations. Are your students going to be summarizing blog posts? Are they how much and how often? Are they are you can you can uh, assign certain roles on a weekly basis? So one student might lead the discussion, one one student might summarize, one student might be the devil's advocate. Um, and what is your role in the discussion? Like we mentioned, sometimes entering the discussion can shut things down. So you have to decide what your role is. Um, are you just going to be a lurker or summarize at the end? Certainly you're going to go in and moderate to make sure uh, misunderstandings aren't being perpetuated. Um, a couple of different deadlines for things where you're having participation, where students' original posts might be due uh, several days late uh, before uh, comments so that students actually have something to comment on besides their own. You have the people, early adopters, who are going to go in and, and get in there and um, and then the people who will wait until the last deadline day to do anything. Um, and then make sure you're asking good questions. Make sure that you're not asking closed questions. Um, you know, having students share their knowledge, uh, share what's in their environment, how it relates, um, place based questions, community, culture, um, you know, ask, ask good questions where students are able to bring in elements of prior knowledge, new thoughts, um, to have a to have a good discussion. Um, so that's kind of facilitating and I went too far. Um, so we talked about revising and reviewing. Um, you know, make sure you have a variety of performance types. Make sure you're giving students a chance to be creative. Um, make sure uh, your assessments are meeting your outcomes. So that's kind of that backwards design again. Where where are my outcomes, and am I creating an assessment that that give me um, authoritative uh, understanding that that students are getting it. Um, I often keep notes in a class in in my Blackboard class. I have a separate section that's hidden that I keep notes to myself about things that I might want to change or do next time. It's just a handy place to, to keep things all contained. Um, and then um, as a final note um, on my family review part of my um, my review is that next time we should go to Hawaii and stay at a resort for my family to use them. So. That would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, fine. <laughs> so do we have any questions or comments? This has been a whole lot of really good information. And I am so glad that I remembered to push the record button so because we can all go back and we can look at this but um but do you have questions or or anything for Heidi um either specific to your unit or or philosophical in nature um or strategies based in nature um this is a really oh that's that's exactly what I was going to ask for the link was for the information. So I really liked all this information. You know, Lee, you probably know this about me. I'm always contemplating how I could get some kind of career from my sailboat. And I, I was just thinking, you know, I, it, you guys really locked in the graduate and undergraduate level, you know, uh, online courses. Like Lee, what I've seen, it's really organized. It follows just along with what Heidi did. But you don't really see this with K-12 education. And I'm thinking to myself now, huh, this is something like to use 
these kind of tools and start developing courses that you could have kids practice doing synchronously or asynchronously in the K-12, there might be a market for doing some kind of course, course design for, mm -hmm. for younger students. Yes. And um, I don't know how official this is, but um, the University of Alaska Southeast is now um, is now uh, Acklin, and so Acklin, the K twelve online course repository, and so my dean has a grand vision of. Um, contracting with really good teachers to build really good courses to put in that database and then making those people adjuncts for the university as they teach these classes at a distance to K-12 students. How exciting. Yes. It's <laughs> only to say, mm, yeah. there is a market for this. <laughs> yeah, I, I really think so. And you, you have so many students out in the bush, well, especially in Alaska, You've got so many students working at different levels that I think they could tap into, you know, units of instruction that are, I don't know, um, could be a, even a charter school model that's all distance or who knows what. But I, it sure does seem like there's a market for K-12 out here. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Okay. What does that become official? That really good. I'm sorry, Colin. I oh, was just wondering when that would become official. I think, I'm pretty sure it's official, but I don't know if it's public yet. We were told Wednesday that the MOA had been signed. So that was yesterday. That was only yesterday. So I'm not <laughs> sure when it will become public or how it's going to get rolled out. And I hope I'm not in trouble for saying anything about it. But, I mean, she said the, the contract had been signed. So I feel like it, it's probably out there. It just hasn't been fully announced yet. So I got another question for Heidi, then I think I'm all done. Hey. Any questions anyway. Yeah. But so so Heidi, in, in one of the slides you mentioned you, know, you had like all the different forms of communications from Twitter to blogs to you know the actual Blackboard uh, forms and that sort of thing. I mean at what point do students become sort of um, just kind of lost? They're not sure exactly which, where to post, when, how, what you know, I I saw that with other students in, in classes previous. It just it's sort of like there's so many different forms of communication. They just like they just not they just got this paralysis happens. Sure. Um, certainly, you know, in an ed tech type class, I I don't think that maybe there should be a limit because you want your students to be exposed to uh, many different types of social media. But in other types of classes, you know, I think, um, you know, if you're pushing your information out in many forms, um, that's different from making them do it. Um, so I think you should, you know, if you, you should use your forms, forms for getting material out, but if you're asking students to do it, um, we often say, you know, Besides Blackboard, you might only want to use two different types of tool um, for creating or sharing information. So, you know, you you probably don't want students to be using Twitter and Vigo and uh, Facebook and Pinterest and a, a variety of social media for just a, a history course or a math course. You're going to want to limit that to just a few places. Um, but certainly, if they're already using the media, you know, provide them with with a tag hashtag or a category or something so that you can, you know, you and the students that do use those media can can keep up with it. But we usually, you know, say, you know, limit your tool use to just a couple. Yeah. Any other questions? So all those links are on my blog post. And you know, I'm still free to ask questions. And I know that was a lot of information. I apologize for jumping um, at the end of the day, um, but I had I, there was a lot to cover. <laughs> there was, and you did, and it was great. Okay. And um, just going back to you know, when we're talking about K-12 um, students, and even when we're talking about undergraduate students who are in a history course or an English course, 
I really believe we do have um, a duty not to let the technology get in the way of the learning. And it, it's unfortunate that we still have to worry about that, um, but we do. And so uh, it's just not fair to them if the course objectives are humanities or, or history or math that they're struggling with something technology-based. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's unfortunate, but it's there. So um, this this has been wonderful, Heidi. Thank you so much. Um, we had a lot of people today who wanted to be with us and who couldn't be with us and who emailed and said, uh, it was it recorded? I just have gotten two emails from people saying, was this recorded? Please send the link. So um, we're going to get this up on the website as soon as we can and share the link. And uh, thank you, Heidi, for being with us. I hope that the fire gets controlled and the wind blows in a different direction for you. Yeah, and Barbara, I'm coming, coming home tomorrow, so I'm happy for that. <laughs> that's good. The air is very fresh here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, Barbara, I hope you have fun on the boat. And Colin, knock yourself out updating all those uh, all those systems. God, it's awful. <laughs> I've got I've got 15 computers open in this room right now, and it's kind of I walk around with my laptop with the Heidi, and I, it's okay as I go around. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I hope that will end for you soon. <laughs> well, uh, thank you all, and do let me know if you have any questions or any concerns. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. You. See y'all later. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.